so thank you. And so in this session, we're going to be exploring how agroforestry can contribute towards climate change mitigation and adaptation. And uh, us gathered here today, we're believing that the potential of agroforestry and that the land management and farming sectors have a vital contribution to make meeting global targets on climate change. Yet we can see that challenges exist in determining how to apply known solutions at scale. So in this session, we're going to explore how agroforestry, which is the deliberate integration of trees and shrubs in the farmed landscape, could be one such solution. And I've got a fantastic panel of speakers here with me today that are going to be presenting different perspectives. So um, we've got Becky Wilson of the Farm Carbon Toolkit, and she's going to be discussing how we can measure the carbon impact of agroforestry and some of the issues around that. Then Andrew Barber, hopefully he will be joining us very soon, and he will offer a farming perspective, outlining how they've worked to integrate trees and livestock on their upland farm and forestry business, which is known Mains of Fincastle in Highland Perthshire. And finally, we've got Will Simonson from the Organic Research Centre. He's Principal Agroforestry Researcher and Head of Research there, and he'll be giving an overview of the current policy landscape and key entry points for agroforestry systems that to be recognised within this. So I'm Charlotte Vickler, Knowledge Exchange and Policy Manager at the Organic Research Centre. I'm going to chair discussion following on from presentations from these speakers. And we've got plenty of time for discussion at the end, so please do send questions and comments via the chat. We would really like to hear more about your interest in agroforestry and your experiences of working with trees in the farm landscape. So briefly, this is session is part of a series of work supported by Farming the Future, which is a funding programme um, to boost agroecology across the UK. And the ORC have worked with the Soil Association, Land Workers Alliance and Woodland Trust to raise awareness with, within policy communities of the potential for agroforestry. And as part of this session and this wider project, we're producing a policy brief that will summarise some of the key points coming out of what we will discuss today. So you're invited to contribute to this brief. Uh, we've got Andrew here, which is great. Um, and if you'd like to keep in touch about the policy brief, then uh, I'll share my email address in the chat and uh, please get in touch and we can keep in touch about the discussion, that following on the discussion and developing this policy brief together. So there's also going to be a link shared to another sister event that we did, which is all about how agroforestry can contribute to biodiversity conservation. And we look forward to hearing from you and your thoughts about both these topics in the discussion this afternoon. So this is great. We've got Andrew. <laughs> Hello, Andrew. And we can kick off. I'll start share screen sharing uh, with Becky from the Farm Carbon Toolkit. There we go. So thanks everyone for joining and I'll pass over to Becky now. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Charlotte. And it's lovely to uh, be with you all this afternoon um, at this session, really looking at something that's really important in terms of how agroforestry can be one of those key management practices or strategies that we can use to start to address climate change. Now, what I'm gonna be talking about this afternoon is very much some of the challenges and how, if we're going to go through this process and we're gonna implement agroforestry systems within our farmed landscape, how we can actually make sure that we're able to measure the value of those from a carbon perspective. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we do at the Farm Carbon Calculator and the Farm Carbon Toolkit and some of the experiences that we've had in trying to make sure that we can actually accurately take account of what's happening both in terms of the above and the below ground sequestration that's happening when we implement some of these agroforestry systems on the farm. Thanks Charlotte, next slide. So my name's Becky um, and I'm sort of technical and project manager at the Farm Carbon Toolkit. For any of you that haven't heard of the Farm Carbon Toolkit, we're a farmer led organisation um, that was set up back in 2009, really to try and provide 
practical tools and resources for farmers and growers on how to manage greenhouse gas emissions, um, how to minimise them, what that impact is both in terms of on their business resilience, on their soil health, um, with a real understanding of how to do that in a practical way which allows that farming system to continue. So we have our two main resources of the organisation, which are our carbon calculator, um, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about as we go through in the context of agroforestry. Now that allows you to measure your carbon balance, so areas on the farm that are generating those greenhouse gas emissions, so emissions that are coming from carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide, and then areas on the farm which are holding carbon um, either through carbon storage or through sequestration, and with that we also include what's happening in terms of soil carbon sequestration. And that then allows you to generate your carbon balance, which allows you to understand, especially if we think about the uh, proximity to net zero, where you are and being able to demonstrate the benefit or the potential benefit of some of these solutions that we'll be talking about this afternoon. So we have a carbon calculator. We also then have um, a toolkit which allows you to understand what that number means, break it down into manageable chunks in terms of things that you can do or practices that you can do that will reduce emissions. And then on the other side, really focusing on what are the things that you can do that actually improve carbon storage. Now, I suppose our USP is that we're farmer led so while we're real advocates for the fact that you know farmers talking to farmers is the way that really things makes change happen um, and as i say we've been active and, and talking around these sort of things for about the last 10 years thanks charlotte next slide so if we think for a minute about the importance of being able to calculate carbon uh, and especially our carbon footprint on the farm and it's the sort of old adage of we can't manage what we don't measure so identifying the carbon footprint of your business is that first step in terms of being able to quantify the contribution that your farm is making to climate change. And put very, very simply, all a carbon calculator does is it identifies the amount and the source of those three greenhouse gas emissions. So carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide that are emitted from the farm and highlights areas where you might be able to make improvements um, or reductions to your emissions. It also then highlights areas on the farm which are currently generating that sequestration or storage. So again, if we start thinking about those agroforestry systems, that will be taking account of what's happening within those trees that we're planting. But on a wider farming context, understanding the importance of carbon storage within our farm hedgerows, within our farm environmental areas and what's happening within our soil. And it allows us to evaluate future projects. So again, ideally, we can have a system where if we were thinking about implementing an agroforestry system, we would be able to understand the impact on our carbon footprint of doing it. It also provides a baseline. So if we start thinking about some of the discussions or wider, wider conversations that we might be having about agriculture's ability as an industry to reach net zero or beyond, and that's very much that sort of wider policy discussion, but also if we think at an individual farming system, what are, where we are in terms of our individual position and our baseline and where we might want to go in the future. Measuring your carbon footprint through doing a car, using a carbon calculator puts that line in the sand or sticks that stake in in terms of understanding Understanding where you are and providing that baseline, which you can then revisit on a regular basis with that regular assessment to understand whether your farm is moving in the right direction. It also allows a positive narrative. And we really need a positive narrative for our industry at the moment, especially when we start talking about our environmental impact. Having a carbon calculator and being able to understand and change that discussion with consumers, with wider industry, with policymakers around what's actually happening on your farm and how you are able to contribute not just to your own farm net zero journey, but more widely in terms of our industry's farm net zero ambitions, really, really starts by understanding what's happening on your individual farm. And if we have that data, if we have that knowledge and that ability to create a narrative around it, we can really start to change that conversation. But more importantly, when we've got that initial baseline, we can then start to assess future management strategies. So really starting to understand what the impact of changing management practices may be. And again, when we start thinking about how agroforestry fits into that, not only understanding an assessment of the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, but also more importantly on the sequestration side, as well as understanding that there will be a benefit from implementing those trees, really starting to delve down into the detail in terms of how much of a benefit from what type, of, what type of planting strategy and how will that impact in terms of offsetting some of my other emissions. Thanks, Charlotte. Next slide. So 
if it's so important and we need to do it, how does carbon calculating work? And I'm sure for most of you, it will be the thing that you want to do, number one, after doing tax returns and going to the dentist and all those other really exciting things that we all want to spend our time doing. Carbon calculating doesn't tend to be very high up the agenda in terms of what we want to do. But actually, for some of those reasons that I spoke about in the previous slide, it's actually really important in terms of understanding where we are, where we've come from and where we're going to. And I know it's often seen to be very, very complicated and involve lots and lots of data collection, all the rest of it. Putting it very simply, it's just a subtraction sum. So on the emission side, we total up everything that's happening on the farm that's generating emissions. And from generating emissions, we're talking about those three gases. So anything that's being produced, that's producing carbon dioxide, that's producing methane, or that's producing nitrous oxide. So again, we're then looking at what's happening in terms of how much fuel we're using on the farm. So on farm diesel, electricity, we're then looking at what we're using in terms of materials and the embedded carbon within our capital items, so our tractors, our machinery. We're looking at our cropping systems and our livestock systems. So how much of different crops are we growing? What are we doing in terms of our livestock enterprises? How are we managing those livestock in terms of what we're feeding them and, and everything else that goes within those systems? We're looking at what we're doing in terms of fertilizer. So what type of fertilizer are we applying and what rates and what's that doing in terms of impact on soil management? And then what's happening in terms of waste and we add up all of the data that's happening under those different categories and that's our total emissions and quite often that's where the discussion has stopped in the past with carbon footprinting so we've just been looking at the negative but as i'm sure we'll talk about more as we go through today agriculture although we're complicated we've got these sort of complex biological systems and we've got leaky systems so if we were to hoover off all of agricultural activity tomorrow we would still be producing greenhouse gas emissions as a result of the carbon and nitrogen cycle we are unique in our ability to provide that carbon solution so it's really important when we do our carbon footprint and we do our calculations that we take account of that ability to be able to hold carbon on the farm so we need to make sure that within the calculations, we're able to calculate that current sequestration. And so that's a case of understanding what's happening on the farm in terms of our areas of hedgerows, our areas of trees, what's happening in terms of any environmental areas that we have, any wetlands, any important habitats, and also how much carbon we're holding within our soils. And all of that together makes up our total sequestration. And then, once we've done that data collection, it is then a very simple subtraction exercise in terms of total emissions, take away sequestration, which gives us our total carbon balance. And you can see from that little picture down the bottom there that actually when we do that, we can start to have some quite exciting conversations. And unlike your bank account, a negative number here is actually a good thing. OK, because what that means is that in this farming example, actually this farm is holding or pulling out of the atmosphere more carbon than it is emitting. So it's carbon positive. And only through going through that process can we then start to have those exciting conversations as, well, actually, is this as a result of what I'm doing year on year? Or have I done something specifically different to get that point? And what you'll find is that although we're generating those emissions from those three gases, we actually, because we're a slightly complex or a complex industry that has different gases, we then express those in terms of tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Thanks, Charlotte. So that's how it works in practice, in principle. Now, if we start to think about integrating agroforestry systems into carbon footprinting, there are a couple of complications or a couple of things that we have to think about. So if we think about how we account for woodland within our carbon calculator, well, we usually account for it in a block format. So within the calculator, when we put in our sequestration tab, we can add in how much, how much woodland we've got in terms of an area basis. So we can put in the number of hectares or the number of acres. We can account for individual trees. So we, ha we have a session within the calculator where we can put in in-field trees. And we can look a little bit at different planting formations, but only at the moment for timber trees. Everything that's come out of Woodland Carbon Code and all of the data that's come in from forest research and all those, we've got a really good understanding of what's happening in terms of those timber trees. We're also starting to get some quite interesting research looking at different planting densities and planting mixes together. 
problem that we slightly have so if you're timber trees you're absolutely fine you can do that if you're planting them in rows if you're planting them in blocks depending on what the design of your system is we're able to accurately take account and we can do that on a detailed basis so really putting in the age profile of those trees and their planting density or we can just do it on a very on a very broad category and you can just categorize them in terms of mixed woodland broadleaf woodland or coniferous woodland so within timber trees we're okay if we're starting to look at some of those orchard crops or we're starting to plant not just timber species but we're also starting to plant fruit or nut trees then our current understanding and research in terms of that planting formation and the carbon values per tree is slightly more limited so actually being able to understand again if we're planting in rows or we're planting in blocks at the moment within the carbon calculator we can take account of those on a per hectare basis but actually breaking that down into the individual tree and what that carbon sequestration is within that tree is slightly more challenging. And again, if we start to also think about the carbon sequestration of different varieties, so we have a value for top fruit, we have a value for stone fruit, we have a value for those, but actually within that, so we're just doing a bit of work at the moment looking at the difference between heritage apple varieties and more commercially grown varieties. So all of this is stuff that we still need to work out. The other really important thing is actually being able to take account the soil benefits and the trees without double counting. So when we do count, account for woodland within the carbon calculator at the moment, that value that sits within the woodland has a figure that's based on a percentage value of how much carbon is within the above ground biomass, how much carbon is within the below ground biomass, and that is the combined figure that comes in. When we're carbon footprinting and we're taking account of what's happening within our soil sequestration, then obviously that we do that completely separately. So if we're going to combine the two together, we need to make sure that we can take accurate account of what's happening in terms of the enhanced soil sequestration from implementing those agroforestry systems without using the methodology that's within the sort of woodland carbon code at the moment, where a percentage of that is allocated for soils. Thanks, Charlotte. So. The other key part of this is understanding what's happening within the soil. So we know that obviously under our trees, both from the sort of makeup of, of sort of fungal networks through the root systems and all that, you know, um, you know, enhanced amount of litter that's going back into the system. We know that a proportion of the carbon sequestration that's allocated to trees is actually happening within the soil and is being held within the soil. So we're really keen to understand what's happening within the soil within agroforestry systems and actually is that is that more enhanced is that less enhanced how does those benefits actually percolate out into the rows in between the trees to actually provide those benefits and so we've been running a soil carbon project um, over the last four years really with the main focus of how do we measure manage and monitor soil carbon but within that we have three farms within our cohort of 100 farms that are starting to implement those agroforestry systems so within that within the project we're monitoring um, soil organic carbon and soil organic matter at three depths so 0 to 10 10 to 13 30 to 50 but we're also looking at a range of other soil health parameters as well as assessing what's happening above ground in terms of crop productivity and then below ground in terms of looking at soil health through structure and infiltration and biological activity and all those sort of things and although we've not got enough data for it to be statistically significant if we look anecdotally within those three farms, the soil health parameters and the change within those fields that they have implemented those agroforestry systems compared to the fields next door, which are a similar soil type and similar rotation, are really encouraging, both from a biological perspective, but also from an enhanced soil carbon perspective. And we're still analysing that data to be able to see whether we can pull that into the carbon calculator. But at the moment, all of the signs are looking really positive. Thanks, Charlotte. So hopefully that's just given you a little bit of an overview with some of the challenges in terms of carbon footprinting agroforestry systems. The research and the sort of capability of these calculators is still evolving, but please don't be disheartened by that. It is still possible, but we might, there are a few caveats that just need to be put in there. There's some real exciting work to be done that we've started looking at understanding those interactions between soil carbon and tree carbon and how within agroforestry systems that can really be included within that accounting process. So watch this space and also more importantly if you are implementing agroforestry systems on your farm and actually you're really interested or you would like to have more and 
more knowledge or more understanding about the carbon benefits and you're happy for us to come and dig some holes and and feed you into the research then please get involved please get in touch because we'd be really happy uh, to work with you guys and see if we can get some better and enhanced monitoring and measuring tools to really be able to accurately demonstrate the benefits that these systems have we know as i say we know that they do anecdotally but really being able to understand and as i said earlier being able to sort of strategically understand the difference between different species of tree different planting patterns will really really help equip us with us that knowledge that understanding to be able to pr promote those positive changes so that's hopefully just a bit of a summary of where we are um, I say I'm happy to, to answer more questions when we get to the, the question bit, um, but I think my details are on the following slide. Um, so if you would like to get involved or get in touch, please do. Thanks, Becky. That was a really great introduction for the session and the context and the benefits, but also the challenges of how we can, um, yeah, quantify those and then translate that into policy as well is is, is challenging and. Um, and I've shared the link to the Farm Carbon Toolkit in the chat. And if anyone's got any questions for Becky, please do um, send them over. And we'll, we've got plenty of time for discussion at the end. But now I'd, I'm glad to say Andrew's here. <laughs> and um, I'm going to invite him to uh, come and tell us a bit more about his uh, trials and tribulations with agroforestry in Highland Perthshire. Hi, Andrew. Hello. Andrew, can you hear us? Oh no, we can't hear you. <laughs> Oh. Let me just try and see if we can get some support on the tech side with your mic. Nina, any ideas what might be happening? I'm just wondering whether it could be first thing to try is to see whether Andrew, if you turn your video off and but leave, you know, stay unmuted to see whether you could, it's something to do with your connection. Uh, hello, I am getting, yeah. I missed most Working. of that. I'm a Oh, we can hear you now. I'm afraid the sound is very poor here. Can you hear me? Yes, we've I can got hear you. you. You hear me? Yep, we can hear you. That improve things? Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but you're breaking up a little bit because I think okay. just your connection well, isn't I great. Turned my video off. Just to put up each slide one, two, three, four, five. I will try and speak slowly. I, I, um, Charlotte have has my no I'm sorry about this. Anyway, shall we try? Yeah, we can hear you. I've got the slides here, so let's let's Hi. have a go. <laughs> Hello. Oh, Maybe um Andrew, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Nina, maybe we can get Andrew to dial in and in the meantime, we can ask Will to do his presentation. Would you be able to organise that? I'm so um, I can try. I can Sorry, try. And I, I'm not hearing anything. Well, no, we've got so, a bad connection, Andrew. I'm going to give you a... Yes. We'll, um, we'll um, try and help yes. get some technical no, support. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, great. great. Thank you. Yeah. And then we'll and then move on to Will and then you can come back, hopefully, all being well. Okay. Try send me a telephone number if need be. Perfect. 
we'll yeah. we'll we'll sort that out. Okay, great. So <laughs> we'll move on to Will. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Will. Uh, do you want to share your own slides? Yeah, perhaps I, I will do that, yeah. Charlotte. Actually, yeah, that'd be great. Um, okay. Um, so let me just share my screen. And I'll put it on the slide presentation. Okay, well, hopefully you're seeing my uh, title slide. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Will Simonson, and I'm from Organic Research Centre, where I head up our research programme in agroforestry, as well as have oversight over our other research themes in the organisation. I really hope we can come back to, to Andrea. I was looking forward to um, hearing about this, this practical example um, of implementing agroforestry and upland farming. Um, my talk is rather different. It's kind of thinking about the policy context around all of this. And what I want to do is um, start off thinking internationally about that policy landscape, because um, I think that's quite helpful to understand um, how the interest in agroforestry within our country is actually fitting in with um, recognition of, the, of its potential worldwide. But I'm very quickly going to zoom in um, to the kind of European and then the UK policy context and focus in particularly on the environmental land management um, scheme, which is being designed um, for England, and talk about the test and trials process and in particular the agroforestry test project that uh, we're leading. Um, and I'm going to finish by just um, briefly sketching over some of the kind of key questions and issues that are arising from that, particularly in relation to climate change mitigation, but also more generally around upscaling agroforestry. So um, in terms of the, the international context, um, obviously we've been hearing a lot about the, the Glasgow COP and, and the UN Framework Convention on um, Climate Change is really significant here, isn't it? And the, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel, Panel on Climate Change, um, they published a special report in 2019, Climate Change on Land. And within that, they estimated that agroforestry worldwide has mitigation potential of up to um, six gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year, um, depending on which response options were chosen. But as well as that climate change mitigation um, potential, there's obvious other benefits. And for example, in soil erosion and helping to adapt to, to climate change. And um, the previous COP meeting in Madrid, um, nature-based solutions came to the fore in the discussions and agroforestry was often cited as a key example. And I think it's because of that, that agroforestry is also relevant to the other two Rio conventions, the Convention on Biological Diversity and on Combating Desertification. Um, and, um, because there's increasing sort of recognition really of the importance of looking at the synergies between these conventions, how they uh, interrelate and overlap. And um, so, for example, at next year's uh, Biodiversity COP, which will be another hugely significant event, um, agroforestry will surely be featuring there, as it has done in previous discussions, um, for its value in supporting biodiversity, uh, for example, in buffering natural habitats and creating corridors between them. And um, in relation to the Convention on Combating Desertification, the, um, the IPCC report that I mentioned talks about agroforestry being able to um, address land degradation in many different situations. And it's estimated that you know, as many as 1.3 billion people could benefit in terms of food security through agroforestry. So um, the Rio Conventions Pavilion, which I've just kind of mentioned here on this slide, this is actually, um, this is was at Glasgow and it will be appearing um, at uh, future COP events um, for the CBD and um, UNCCD. And um, this will be about exploring those, uh, the options for actually realizing those synergies. But I think another kind of uh, international uh, initiative that's uh, also significant is the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, 2021 to 2030. Um, which is seeking to mobilise action towards global targets for uh, restoring degraded lands. And again, agroforestry is seen as uh, having real potential uh, for, for that as well. And then when we come to um, kind of European policy and um, agroforestry is referenced in the European 
European Green Deal, uh, which is the European Commission's roadmap for making uh, Europe the first climate neutral uh, continent by 2050. And it's also features in the EU's flagship new food, food policy, the farm to fork strategy. And um, among um, 26 measures to be tackled by 2024 within that strategy is one that talks about an initiative to reward farming practices that remove CO2 from the atmosphere, um, including through developing a regulatory framework for certifying carbon removals based on robust and transparent carbon accounting. And of course, agroforestry is really uh, relevant within that whole um, uh, kind of um, emphasis. Um, and I think it's also worth pointing out that the, uh, the Horizon um, 2020 projects, these um, EC funded um, scientific collaborations over the last decade and, and more years before that, have sought to network scientists um, and other stakeholders in, in activities exploring this potential of agroforestry. So there was the, the Affinet uh, Innovation uh, Networks is one example, but other um, really significant projects have been Ag Forward and uh, Sustain Farm, but there are a number of others as well. And these projects have been important um, for building the sort of evidence base for how agroforestry can be implemented at scale and with what environmental benefits. Um, for example, um, Ag Forward, under the Ag Forward project, the yield safe model was developed for modeling resource capture and productivity in uh, silver arable systems um, across different climates and geographies and production systems. And um, another investigation under that same project sought to identify priority areas across Europe um, according to a set of environmental pressure criteria. Uh, where agroforestry could be implemented. And then, then it kind of estimated what the climate change mitigation potential of rolling out agroforestry in those areas would be. And it was considered to be in the order of um, about 7.3 tonnes of carbon per hectare per year, or 63 million tonnes per hectare per year across the entirety of those areas. When we come to the UK, um, the Committee on Climate Change's 2020 report um, identified actions needed in the land use sector for achieving a net zero in the UK by the middle of this century. And it included increasing UK forestry cover from 13% to at least 17% by 2050 um, by planting um, at least 30,000 hectares woodland each year. And together with improved woodland management, uh, this would deliver annual emissions sequestration by 2050 of 14 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent in forests with an additional 14 um, million tonnes um, from harvested materials. So they're, they're the kind of bars at the bottom of this, this circle. But in addition, agroforestry could deliver further 6 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent savings by 2050, according to this report. Um, and the, the England Trees Action Plan, published in May of this year, commits the government to this annual target of 30,000 uh, hectares of woodland creation by the end of um, this parliament. That's per year, should I say? Yeah. And um, this would um, also be supporting the 25-year environment plan and um, helping in terms of the nature recovery network as well. Um, and Within this action plan, there's also the target to, um, or recommendation, that agroforestry should be used on at least 10% of arable land and grassland by 2050. And there is an action to provide financial support for agroforestry through the England Woodland Creation Offer. But as recognised um, by the Royal Agricultural Society of England in their pre-COP26 briefing, that the role of agriculture and decarbonisation is not just about the carbon sequestration, uh, but it's also about adopting circular economy principles, uh, including cycling of nutrients and water, uh, natural resources. And again, agroforestry can play a really important role in that through the ecological functions that the trees have and how those are managed. So, um, of course, to consider the uptake of agroforestry at scale, we need to be looking at the, the new subsidy grant um, regimes across the developed nations of the UK, resulting from Brexit. And um, that obviously includes the Environmental Land Management Scheme in England. 
the so-called public money for public goods agenda. And this consists of uh, three components, um, which I'll briefly describe. I expect this is familiar to, to many of you, but there's um, component or tier one is uh, the sustainable farming incentive. So this is the scheme that applies to um, farmers and all of their land holdings, including farm woodland. And it is designed to be attractive and straightforward uh, for everyone to take part, um, paying for actions um, to manage land in an environmentally sustainable way. And those actions are grouped into um, simple packages called standards um, to make it as easy as possible for farmers to identify those ones that are best suited to their land and their business. And those, some of those standards are actually being piloted at the moment and they include things like um, arable and horticultural land management, the management of their soils, the management of land and, and soils of um, grasslands, whether high, you know, low input ones or improved grasslands, as well as hedgerows and farm woodlands. So each of those sort of features, there's um, a, set of, uh, a kind of set of standards or options that um, farmers can take up. And the design of an agroforestry standard is also underway. So that's the SFI. And then the second component or tiers is local nature recovery, um, which will pay for actions that support um, and deliver local environmental priorities, um, making sure that the right things are kind of delivered in the right places, if you like. And uh, so this will be supporting the local nature recovery network and um, we'll be aiming to encourage collaboration between farmers and helping them work together to improve the, the local environment. And then thirdly, um, there's the component about landscape recovery. And this will support the delivery of um, landscape and uh, ecosystem recovery through long-term, usually land use change projects. Um, so that might involve restoring wilder landscapes, but that's appropriate, um, large scale tree planting. And this is gonna be piloted um, from next year with around 10 large land use change projects of at least 500 hectares. So um, DEFRA's tests and trials, as I'm sure most of you know, is really about the kind of the design of these future ELM options. And um, because it's very much um, the intention is to sort of co-design them with farmers. And, um, and as part of that, um, the Organic Research Centre, to as long with our collaborators, the Woodland Trust and the Soil Association and Abacus Agriculture, are running the agroforestry test project, which began a year ago and is running until uh, early 2023. And this um, project is focusing on, on two policy areas in particular, um, about payment mechanisms, how the new system uh, will pay participants to practice agroforestry. And secondly, uh, advice and guidance, considering what expert support uh, participants or, or practitioners of agroforestry will require to help them plan and, and record the public goods um, that they will deliver through their agroforestry practice. Um, and in this process, I guess what we're trying to do really is identify what the, the building blocks are um, to, um, to see really successful and effective uptake of agroforestry uh, for ag climate change mitigation, but also for other benefits. Um, so kind of building blocks that are becoming apparent through our work and through earlier work as well is, of course, enterprise viability, the fact that there needs to be a business case um, for adopting agroforestry, favourable regulatory framework needs to be there in place in issues around land use status and uh, environmental impact assessment, for example. There needs to be um, adequate stock of trees and um, supply of other materials and equipment. Um, that's going to be really important. Facilitation to get going, pump priming, um, thinking about the, the considerable um, startup costs that are going to be needed, um, capital costs and other kind of costs, and also um, what farmers will require in terms of um, demonstration systems or the kinds of knowledge to, to really be able to get going. Um, monitoring and evaluation, um, sort of measuring, verifying the public goods outcomes, the role of inspection versus uh, self-assessment is a key question there. And then the, the kind of know-how for implementation and system design, recognizing that these are more complex um, novel systems uh, for many farmers. Um, 
So there's the need for information about the right kind of system, uh, which trees to plant, planting arrangements and densities, but a lot more the size that fit with the local conditions um, to any one farm in question. Um, getting the right kind of blend of public and private finance is important and the phasing of that, that needs some careful planning in relation to the longevity of agroforestry systems. And then finally, the question of uh, climate change resilience that agroforestry, in order to um, be able to do something significant in terms of climate change mitigation, also needs to be resilient uh, to the climate change itself, um, not just the climatic trends of perhaps drying or, or warming, but extreme weather events, um, changes in um, pest invasiveness and uh, things like that. So the um, approach of our agroforestry test is um, really to um, talk to farmers uh, across the country. And we've organized uh, six um, groups of, of farms, um, clusters of farms, each with a, a different type of agroforestry that they're focusing on. Um, so there's the uh, Eastern cluster is focusing on silver arable. In the Southwest, we have a silver horticultural focus. In the central area, silver poultry, um, lowland silver pasture in the, the southeast, um, sorry, in the, sorry, the Midlands, I should say, upland silver pasture in the north, northwest, and then woodland grazing and wood pasture in the southeast. And in each of these um, regions, we're holding a, a workshop. We've had three out of the six so far. We've got the fourth one tomorrow in the southeast. And we're basically talking to farmers about what, from their perspective, they experience either already as agroforestry practitioners or people have thought about it, maybe turned away from it for whatever reason, thinking uh, with them, asking them what they would need to actually be persuaded to take it up and how they can see it working in terms of the payments in particular and also um, types of advice and guidance that they would need. And in my final slide, I just wanted to um, just give these um, few kind of headline areas of the issues that are arising so far. And I think all of them are kind of relevant to climate change mitigation, as well as other environmental goods. And these are the things that um, we're going to be needing to sort of thrash out in more detail and consider what that means in terms of the design of these future options. So the first one I've listed here is payments for activities or outcomes. Um, Obviously, the main kind of environmental benefits of uh, an agroforestry system will take time to, to realize because of the um, time needed for the trees to mature and so on. And so there are questions about um, the payments for carbon. Um, you know, there's different carbon trading schemes that will become available. Um, there'll be different schemes for paying for other environmental benefits. So it's kind of considering how that would work in terms of the time scales, in terms of um, payment systems for different um, outcomes of your agroforestry projects, as well as thinking about, you know, obviously the private finance, the um, profitability of the, the produce that we produced from the system as well, longer term. Secondly, is the consistency of measurement of outcomes. So this is really kind of, I suppose, where the work that Becky's presented is, is incredibly um, important, thinking about um, a really robust system for um, measuring the carbon emissions and sequestration and storage on farm, thinking about that over the sort of whole life cycle uh, of a, an agroforestry system and, and of the carbon, of course. Um, one comment from somebody at a recent workshop is that um, it's a bit like the Wild West out there currently. There's no sort of firm guidance and sort of single system that's being employed. And, and that all needs to be sort of, in a sense, brought together and made much simpler and easier to everybody to follow with consistency. Um, that kind of relates a little bit to the third bullet point there, knowledge and evidence. Um, see, farmers do need um, help to get, to get going. As a, another participant um, commented, farmers ate foresters, and, and you know these are new types of uh, farming operation for many, perhaps for most. And so there is the need for um, learning from existing experience. But I guess one of the key questions there is, uh, is there a kind of critical mass of kind of mature agroforestry uh, examples, demonstrations out there that other farmers can learn from? And thinking about the need that that has to be locally relevant as well, as such a range of environmental conditions and farming types and so on. So all of that needs to kind of play into this question of 
making knowledge um, available to farmers who want to take up agroforestry. Um, fourthly, um, there's been lots of talk about the need for a kind of tiered system, um, kind of recognizing that it, it's great to have a sort of entry level broad scheme that a lot of farmers can participate in, but also I think for some, it's going to be relevant to think about a, a higher ambition, a higher level scheme um, that's um, appropriately um, paid for with sort of additional funding, uh, where there is, especially where there is evidence of better kind of delivery of ecosystem services, including climate change mitigation. And then finally, um, well, no, it's not funny. Um, second to last, needing flexibility. So, yeah, this is kind of just recognizing that in the past, farmers have kind of struggled when they, it's been difficult perhaps to um, fulfill all of the obligations for a particular grant scheme. And perhaps have been penalised for that. And thinking about agroforestry as a system that needs to be flexible and adapted to local conditions, how you can design options that, um, rather than being, than being a one-size-fits-all sort of thing, would be a, a kind of one design that can be adapted to, to fit all different sort of local uh, circumstances. And I think um, another kind of key thing there is around flexibility in terms of payments and the ability to be able to exit, for example, a, a government um, payment scheme in order to be able to start to access private sector um, payments for carbon as one example. And then finally, um, longevity and permanence. This has kind of come into the, the discussions a lot around um, thinking about the, you know, the long-term nature uh, of an agroforestry proposition, um, the need to think about the carbon cycle, um, not just on a sort of you know, immediate basis, but thinking about the um, you know, the, the carbon products, that the, the wood products that are going to be produced and, and so on, and the carbon embedded in those. So there's also issues around, um, you know, farm tenancies as well. And what does agroforestry, how can agroforestry work for uh, tenant farmers? Um, again, thinking about that uh, long term sort of scenario and um, need for patience while the sort of a system matures. So hopefully that's given a little bit of sort of food for thought about this kind of key policy questions that we're grappling with. And um, I'll leave it there, but, um, you know, I hope in the sort of questions and discussion, we can perhaps pick up on some of those themes, and especially after um, hearing a, a real life example from Andrew, uh, which I hope we can do, do right now. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Will. We have Andrew here on the phone, so let's fingers crossed, hope that he can hear us and connect. Success. Hi, Andrew, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Very exciting. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Woo! <laughs> No, I'll get uh, your slides up. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you. Very glad you could join us. <laughs> Sorry for all the technical yeah. problems. No, it's uh, it's um, part of the course. One of the joys <laughs> of Oxland living. <laughs> OK, great. Can you see the screen as well? Or? Um, hang on, I'll start the video and see if that. I was seeing the screen. For some reason, it's black. Hang on, hang on. It would help. Uh, no. Here we are. Yes, I can see it now. Thank you, everyone. And uh, good afternoon from Highland Perthshire. I'm going to be going through our thinking and approach to the question of how trees can help us on our kind of farm in our efforts to address the climate challenge. So as you can see from this photograph, we're very much an upland unit. The farm buildings on the left of the photograph under the A and the G, they sit at about a thousand feet and the farm runs up to 1500 feet with just a few fields down below the thousand foot mark that you see in front of you there. Um, so very much upland. Um, and next slide, please. And you will be all familiar with this type of slide, which shows the long-term problem of lack of profitability in those sectors commonly found in the uplands. We are an LFA cattle and sheep producer on the farm here at Fincastle. The light green columns are the profit or loss before subsidy, and the dark green once you add the subsidy back in. 
Um, it's not good reading, really. Uh, the current strong prices that we've had this year are more than welcome, but we recognise the damage that the UK government's trade deals could do to this long-term profitability problem. So what to do about these challenges is the question in our minds, and carbon is part of the solution in our thinking, rather than just part of the problem. Next slide, please. And you'll be familiar with this taken off, um, I can't mind, what is, was it, The Guardian? Oh, it's from Sheffield University. Um, you'll be familiar with this type of thinking. Sheep are the enemy and trees are the answer. And you go to the next slide and you'll see what we do about it. That's exactly what we do about it, as this is this basic approach dating from the 1980s is still essentially being promoted and practiced, despite the industry assertions to the contrary. Industry is much better at managing shapes in the uplands, but the monoculture is still largely there. And this is what frightens farmers. So is there another way to up our tree cover without losing our farms? We think that agroforestry holds promise in this regard. So what we're hoping to do is to share with you the results of our endeavors over the years. Next slide, please. And you will also be this uh, be familiar with this type of approach um, in, in uh, management terms. Um, the uh, last 20 years or so, we've been moving in the direction you see here in these bullet points. Um, and we've been slowly expanding our woodland cover here for actually 30 years since we started farming. And initially, that was just for livestock, shelter, and biodiversity. But increasingly, over the last, I don't know, 15 years, the carbon question has really come to dominate our thinking. Next slide, please. By the early 2000s, we'd become interested in wood pasture as a way forward, and eventually got ourselves organized to trial it. Wood pasture is an old idea and has these three components that you can see there. The canopy cover part of the definition is entirely mine. I've just drawn it from how the Scandinavians use the term. They have a lot of this type of land use. I have no idea if that meets any academic definition, but that's what we think of anyway when we use this term. And the key thing is that, as opposed to just a grazed woodland, is that you have to take into account the management needs of all three components normally the trees get forgotten. So that's a very key part of that definition in our heads. Next slide, please. We trialed the wood pasture system back in um, 2009, when we planted seven hectares, primarily of oak in an alley system. We wanted to start replacing old shelter belts, which were blowing down, but we didn't want to lose ground from the farm to trees. A typical attitude, I'm sure you'll recognize. And we knew that more little shelter belts would bring management problems on the tree side. Essentially, shelter belts are just too small from the point of view of the scale needed nowadays in woodland management. So we realized that the wood pasture system could get around this problem, could do all the things we wanted, which included growing timber as part of farm diversification. We chose oak because of demand here from the craft market, and it used to be the main species grown here in centuries past. Come to Highland Pasture and you'll see the relics of those efforts. They're still all around this part of the world. We also knew then that this approach would help our carbon balance, but we didn't know then the scale of the problem that we faced. So didn't appreciate exactly how much it would help us. Next slide, please. So you'll see here, there's an aerial view of one part of that seven hectares that I was just talking about. You can see it's just a modified plantation model at this establishment phase. We're about to start thinning in here this winter and we'll chip the thinnings for the cattle sheds. So this was a very production oriented approach using hardwoods because of their ability to allow grass growth under a canopy and because we wanted to grow that sort of timber. These plantings augmented woodland already on the farm. Uh, 1960s shelter belts and semi-natural birch woodland, which, and this is a crucial point, are not captured in the IAC systems, but extend now to some, we reckon, 27 hectares, mostly in the lowest part of our farm, and all run on uh, a wood pasture model. 
Next slide, please. So this is what it looks like in terms of carbon footprinting. Our first experience of carbon calculators was with uh, Agriculc in um, five years ago, 2016, a most depressing experience as there was no sequestration element. It just felt absolutely wrong. We repeated the exercise in 2020 as part of a dry run of a new revised version of this calculator that the college up here were trying to um, uh, develop. And here is what it looked like. The tree element was still not in this trial version, so we've added in our estimate of the tree element. The soil sequester about a third of our gross emissions, and the trees another third or more. And this type of analysis, crude as it might be, shows our net emissions for the livestock enterprise. The right-hand column in the graph is, uh, is, the, is the net effect. Um, so it takes roughly our emissions down from about 30 kilos of carbon dioxide equivalent to uh, per kilo of product down to around about the 10 mark. But this, uh, and bear in mind poultry and all the rest of it are around about six or something, so a bit to go. But this type of calculation brings up several major issues. Next slide, please. And the first slide, is how uh, trees are measured. Now, I haven't had the benefit of Becky's talk, so apologize if I'm covering uh, stuff already said, but I suppose the point that sits in my mind here is that everyone is shouting that we need standardization of carbon calculators, and that hasn't happened yet, and it clearly needs to happen when this start, type of data starts to get used, um, either by governments or in our relations with our markets or whatever. So. Um, getting standardization and a proper approach is what's sitting in my mind just now. So apologies, apologies Becky. Firstly, if I've got it all wrong. <laughs> Secondly, if I'm covering what you've already said, I, did, I just couldn't hear it. Um, but I've shown here the carbon data for oak growing at yield class 6 at 60% canopy cover using forest research figures. This is conveniently what we've gone for in those 2009 plantings. Coincidentally, I hadn't to add, um, I hadn't dug out the data at that point. But on the right is the graph. This is also pinched from Forestry Commission book. So uh, thank you, Forestry Commission, um, which shows how foresters traditionally have measured what they've always been interested in, and that's volume, using average volume increment over the lifetime of a stand of trees. Now, no one uses the yearly increment. Um, that's the steep bell-shaped curve labeled CAI, or current annual increment. But instead, use an average annual increment from when the trees were planted to indicate growth rate, the longer, more shallow curve, MAI, mean annual increment. The yield class system, I mentioned yield class this, six. This is uh, us foresters routinely use this as a predictive measure, and it's based on the maximum mean annual increment, the point where these two graphs cross. So for us, we've used this approach to indicate how much volume our wood pasture system will be sequestering over the stand's rotation. Using these forest research published figures, we estimate that this type of wood pasture will be storing over six tons of carbon dioxide on average every year over the 100-year rotation. And this type of calculation appears to be allowed by IPCC rules. Agriculture apparently uses a yield class 10 calculation for commercial woodlands which are managed on a sustainable basis and have an even range of ages. So for us, our lower part of the glen contains most of this 27 hectares of wood pasture, made up of nine hectares of 2009 new wood pasture, which includes that seven hectares of grant aided oak that I described earlier, but also another couple of hectares of birch that we planted outside of grant aid, seven hectares of 1960s Scots pine shelter belt kind of stuff, and seven hectares of 1950s semi-natural birch, willow, juniper, um, sort of stuff you see very much in this part of the world. The pine is at yield class 10, the birch at about yield class four, and the oak at six to eight. So we've just averaged to give us a yield class six and made the same assumption that the agriculture model use. But the woodland carbon code, normally dealing with just one even age group of trees, uses a rather different approach and heavily discounts performance over the first 20 years when current annual increment is quite small. 
this all appears terribly theoretical. Sorry if it sounds like a boring forestry lecture, but how trees are treated in carbon calculators is a pretty crucial one from my point of view. Um, certainly for anyone investing in this mitigation option. Being fair on all sides of the equation, emission and sequestration is a fundamental issue for all farmers who are thinking of planting trees to help their carbon balance. Next slide, please. And the second uh, much bigger issue, of course, is how methane is treated inside carbon calculators. And many of you will have heard the climate scientist, Prof Miles Allen, on the farming program on Radio 4 the other week, criticizing carbon calculators for the use of a flawed carbon dioxide equivalence metric for methane, which doesn't accurately account for methane's impact on temperature. So I put this slide in here, not to spend all of the time talking about it, but simply because the choice of metric here is transformative in terms of our carbon balance, decides whether we will have the potential to sell carbon on a carbon market going forward, or whether we'll need to keep it all inside our business. Now, I stress, however, that in our view, we agree with those who say we must cut our methane emissions. We can do this with the kind of standard approaches of, um, that are being researched and developed, low methane producing stock feed additives. It's not an issue, to do, an argument to do nothing. However, this issue is fundamental as to whether our livestock enterprise is seen as highly carbon positive or mildly carbon negative. Either way, the sequestration element through soil and trees are crucial. Next slide. So some of you will be thinking, what are the practical problems? And I, I'm supposed to be in a session, I think, tomorrow, if all well, the technology hangs together, um, talking about these kind of things. But actually, the things that folks have thrown up to us as problems, in our experience, have actually a positive story to tell, um, and welfare, damage to trees, etc. cetera. Um, however, there's one I should mention here, and that's the impact of afforestation on soil carbon. And so again, apologies, Becky, if I'm uh, treading on something you've already said, but there is a growing realization that blanket afforestation on organic rich soils, and I don't just mean deep peats, results in a loss of soil carbon, which can take a long time to recover through the tree growth. This is really a, a, a big issue in the uplands. So by keeping a living ground vegetation layer, as you would find in agroforestry, wood pasture, it looks like this type of land use could be less susceptible to this fault. So I stress that data is very limited. But in the uplands where we've got so many, so much peaty podzols, this is a real, real issue to think about and one that the forest industry is really quite nervous about. So in conclusion, we see this land use as a major way for us to get to net zero in our enterprise carbon budget, still using the current carbon equivalence metrics, as we don't trust government to do the right thing on that side. There are powerful forces keen to keep the status quo. And as Professor Allen said, there is bureaucratic inertia to overcome. But this is what we think will help differentiate our product from that coming over here in those trade deals. We see it as essential in our survival. It appears the government are going to use consumer choice as the means of supporting or um, controlling standards. And so we need to give the consumer every reason to choose our product. And more than anything else, that will involve the carbon balance. And for us, trees are crucial in that equation. Thank you. Back to yourselves. Thank you, Andrew. That was great. I'm so glad we could get you connected because it was so um, interesting to hear a working example and all those details that um, it's sometimes hard to get your head around when you're thinking about it theoretically. Um, I'd like to invite Becky actually to respond. Um, we've had a question on the chat as well about kind of the practicalities of, of doing carbon accounting and just to reflect on what Andrew presented, it'd be really interesting to hear your thoughts. Absolutely. No, I think I think there's there's a lot of um, alignment with what I said, Andrew, and what you've said. So I suppose a couple of the things specifically, firstly, around the use of the different methane metrics. So GWP 100, uh, which accounts for methane as a long lived climate pollutant with that same level um, of methane persisting in the atmosphere for 100 years versus the new Professor Miles Allen metric in terms of that GWP star. So within the calculator, 
uh, we're able to calculate using both methods. So at the moment, obviously, the Committee on Climate Change and all of the policies and, and abilities to get down to net zero have all been modelled using that GWP 100. So that way that overestimates methane. Um, so it's, it's important that we can do it both ways. But within our calculator, you can press a button and that then allows you to also understand the impact um, of using that addition, that different way of measuring methane. So we can account for it both ways on the methane thing. On the forestry uh, and the different yield classes and all of that information, that's what I was sort of um, hinting at when I was going through in terms of our ability, not just to be able to look at different planting densities, but also the impact on growth and different species mixes and all those sort of things. So we have, uh, you know, we, we can do, again, we can measure sequestration using the woodland carbon code methodology, but we can also do it using individual yield classes um, and the data that's come out of forestry research. The lovely thing to do with trees, especially when we start thinking about timber trees, um, is that actually the data is there. Um, the issue comes then when we try and look at that for other type, other species of tree in terms of fruit or nut trees, that we have to start to develop that data. But for timber trees, depending on the yield class, depending on the different species that are that are mixed together and all those other sort of things as to in terms of the different stands you're growing, um, we can put that. And so what we're probably looking to do is actually increase. So currently we have the, the detailed woodland where you can put that in, but actually the next stage on from that is to be able to enter those yield classes and those different bits of information. It's always that balance between the level of data that people are willing to put in and what they get out of it. But I think certainly on tree side um, and when we're looking at sequestration values, those, those, those probably will be there in the future um, and I suppose the other thing just to say finally in terms of what um, Andrew was saying around that sort of soil carbon loss um, you know from 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 a forested systems um, I would say that as I say we're starting to find that that data um, on the benefits of agroforestry systems as I said within our soil carbon project although they're obviously um, we've only got those three farms that it's working on but we're seeing that actually we're not getting that loss where you do when you have those sort of wide scale wide scale forestry plantings but it's certainly a big a big threat and if we think about where those you know areas of mass forestation are happening and sometimes on those environments that they are happening uh, it's really important to understand current carbon stock in that environment before we look at what's happening so if agroforestry offers an opportunity to protect that carbon within our grasslands or within our soils that are there already and also provide that above ground uh, carbon stock then you know th that's a benefit And Becky, Andrew kind of emphasised the challenges around these calculations and then feeding that into policy. And I wondered if you had any reflections in terms of where you see the direction going in that regard. Absolutely. So, you know, as I said at the beginning, measuring carbon is a key part of being able to manage carbon. The challenge is, which I think Andrew um, highlighted at the beginning, is at the moment we haven't got that consistency of approach um, across calculators. You know, we obviously have a variety. Andrew has obviously used AgriCalc. Um, there's another one called Cool Farm Tool, and then there's ours, which are the three main calculators that people might be using. Um, and we don't have that level of consistency. And one of the reasons for that is obviously the sort of standard specification for carbon accounting um, was last updated back in 2012. So we haven't got a lot of sequestration that's that's seen as a sort of acceptable standard. So I think we need an improvement of standards. But we also need, um, I suppose, that that ability to be able to for our accounting packages or our accounting tools to be able to reflect the diversity of farming systems that we have operating out on the ground. Um, you know, and so we've got to, you know, we've got to really challenge these um, these providers of software, uh, us included, um, to actually better create something that is, yes, scientifically robust, is accepted by policy, but is also useful at the farm level. Um, and certainly I would I would think that actually what we need is we need a system which where for farms, uh, you know, they're actually seeing the benefit and the value of doing this rather than it just being a tick box exercise. And that's where my slight, my slight caution is uh, in terms of if these just become a, a you know, a, a requirement as part of a government scheme or as part of a marketing marketing option, um, then we lose that ability to be able to, to demonstrate the value out the bottom of them. You know, if it just becomes a, a something we have to do as part of a, a compliance requirement. So I think there's a real balance there in terms of being able to make sure that we are asking our software providers in terms of these carbon calculators to better to bring bring you know better reflect what we need at the farm level in terms of being a, something that we can use to make management decisions, but also at the same time providing something which also is, allows us to demonstrate that benefit of these different systems back to our consumers. Thanks, Becky and Andrew. 
Um, building on from that, we've had a question come in from Hannah Field around doing carbon calculations and is there a risk that this would lead to homogenization on your farm if there was a focus on carbon alone and how do you balance that with other land uses for example are there encouraging carbon will that also have benefits for our biodiversity say is there coupling in there and what measures should you also be tracking do you think oh it's a very important point um that's that's um that's being made there there, there is um i think everyone recognizes the danger of um, only thinking about carbon um and uh and and there's a very strong feeling that that is actually happening you hear people saying well equally important is the biodiversity challenge but the, that doesn't hit the press in the slightest it's all about carbon um and so there is a danger uh the, the way it's the way it's actually playing out is in whole scale land 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 use change at the point where farms are sold and that is happening very strongly in Scotland just now and I think it's just started in Wales as well from what I hear but within a farm um the uh one of the challenges for the people who are designing the grant schemes going forward is how you score the biodiversity value of a farm and there's a lot of work going on on that it's all about baselining and whatnot so that you we try and avoid the um uh the overemphasis on carbon um but it's a real challenge to those who are uh, both designing the grant schemes and who are looking at how at the metric side how do you how do you measure what we do on the ground um but at the moment it's a land use change issue and uh, the carbon market is driving major land use change um and has really come right down the hill it's into what would be called pretty good um, farms on the grade well we have different grades grading systems in in scotland and england but you're sort of three i, I think in england the kind of 3.2 land um land that was previously never considered for for planting and it's now being bought by uh, um, commercial interests and it's commercial afforestation that's happening in that. Anyway, that, that's a bit of a ramble. I'm sorry, apologies. I've moved no, on. that's great. Um, you had a background in commercial forestry as well and do you think that's helped you in terms of adoption and I uh, wanted to kind of uh, reflect a bit on the challenges of adoption more widely because we can see their benefits um, regardless of these challenges of complexity and trade-offs. Um, do you find your neighbours thinking you're doing strange things? Or how's it been? Yeah, what's the environment like in terms of agroforestry? And Hannah also reflected on, do people generally know what the term agroforestry means? Or do you talk more about trees on farms? And yeah, it'd be great to hear how it's been perceived more widely in your well, community. Um, well, um, very, very much welcomed in the farming community. Folks get it, uh, mutually get it. Both the people who've not seen it, but uh, you know, heard speak or whatever, um, or the folks who've been here, they mutually get it. They meet, they see what you're trying to do and the benefits and all the rest of it. And folks get quite upbeat about it. Alternatively, I mean, in, in contrast, rather, I should say the forestry community have no interest in it. And uh, I come to the view that one of the big barriers for uptake of this is the fact that this land use is seen as forestry and the grants are, are going to be held inside the forestry department. No interest in it whatsoever. Um, and they see no purpose for it. Why? Well, that's a farming thing. Why should we... Uh, put grant aid money into helping farms we, we're about setting up woodlands it's a siloed mentality and it's rather depressing um and uh so we've i think we've got a a, a cultural problem there and a cultural barrier there um whether that will change i don't know i think it needs to be taken out of forestry and put in the hands of um, probably in the hands of agriculture, um, but working with the, uh, in, in you lot, it would be with English Nature and Nature Scott up here. Um, mm -hmm. That's been my experience. Reflecting on that, Will, have you noticed in the workshops that you've been running across the country, well, England, uh, whether there's been a mix of participants or has it mainly been farmers that have been 
attending. Yeah. Well, it's actually quite, yeah, I was interested by what Andrew was saying there, because in fact, for example, tomorrow we, um, in one of our six workshops, I would think about half the um, people who signed up to attend are actually from the forestry sector, um, rather than the farming sector, which is interesting. Most, most of them from the Forestry Commission, but not, not all of them. So having said that, this one uh, is going to be focused on um, woodland grazing and wood pasture. So <laughs> that probably partly explains it. Although we did also, we have had um, a good representation of um, the forestry sector in the other workshops as well. So I think the level of interest does just seem to be higher, maybe higher in the lowland systems, I don't know. But um, anyway, yeah, we are seeing uh, quite a mix of participants, which is, which is interesting, yeah. And I just wondered while we still have you, um, if you'd like to reflect a bit in terms of, you've seen that there's a lot of demand for agroforestry as a practice in terms of reaching policy targets, but there's these challenges in implementation and, and what feedback, I mean, you've reflected on the key points, but do you feel that people have kind of identified real tangible mechanisms for how to implement it or is what's the feedback that you're getting in, out there? <laughs> yeah. And how to, how to work with it. It's, it's quite mixed. I mean, there's a lot of interest, um, that, that's obvious, but I think there's also hesitancy and some of that might be around seeing what, you know, this new future environmental land management will look like in terms of rewarding agroforestry. Um, so I think it's quite a few farmers waiting in to see. Um, but there's also quite a few who are already experimenting, perhaps on a small scale, doing some initial plantings and, and you know, giving it a go, which is also great. Um, but I think, um, I think it is the access to to knowledge and, and part of that is sort of being convinced about the you know what the markets will be about the profitability that the business case but it's also the kind of the technical aspects as well you know what trees to plant and um and how to manage them how to protect them in the early years all this sort of thing and and then i guess the third area is around the public goods the carbon the biodiversity the water soil conservation um it's quite an interesting question from hannah early on about um in terms of advice, are we needing some upskilling? Are we needing some specific agroforestry advisors? So that's quite an interesting idea that hasn't come up, but something that um, has been reflected on in our workshops is that um, so many different aspects to this, as I've sort of described, that maybe we need a, a lot sort of advice being provided by different sources. So you can imagine, for example, in terms of biodiversity, that that could be best provided by the conservation NGOs, for example, you know. Um, so it's difficult to imagine that um, a typical farm advisor will have perhaps the, the range of knowledge across all of the areas around the, you know, the ecosystem services, as well as the business side, as well as the um, actual practical technical side of implementing it. Yes, thanks, Will. And Becky, do you feel that it comes through in your work, the need for advice and guidance in terms of implementing these practices? Absolutely, absolutely. There is um, definitely, uh, as we start to transition into these more uh, regenerative or, or, or soil focused approaches, um, and especially as we start to bridge the gap between, um, you know, lands, landscape management and potentially forest or tree management, um, it certainly highlights to me there is a massive gap in terms of, uh, in terms of current advisor um, delivery, knowledge, and that consistency of advice, really. Um, we certainly find it within uh, when we start talking about mitigation measures for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and, and sort of implementing soil health, where at the moment, especially on the soil health side, a lot of the um, a lot of the farmers are almost starting to be slightly ahead of the research in terms of some of their practices that they're trying on farm. Um, so we're, we, you know, the farmers are leading the way, and it's how do how does the advice sector really catch up with that and provide those consistent messages um, that actually are rooted in knowledge and research and and you know provide those those practical things that that farmers can do differently um and it's a real challenge as we move forward and i think especially as will says as we start to navigate some of these new funding mechanisms both from sort of elms uh, and those sort of things sustainable farming incentive but also the new emerging world of carbon trading markets and you're right will it is a complete wild west out there at the moment and there are lots of watch outs to look out for um and again if anyone's interested we've got a big um a big section of that on our website um you know the, the need for you know independent practical uh, guidance is is really key 
Um, and I think we need to a level of CPD uh, for our advisory sector to make sure that they're as equipped as possible to be able to help their farmers uh, and their, you know, their clients be able to keep abreast of all these changes. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Becky. We've, it's been really gone really quick and we've actually only got five minutes left. So I'd like to um, say thanks to everyone for the questions and comments coming in on the chat. We've not managed to get through them all actually, but um, it's really good to read and I'll save them down and I'll feed them into this policy brief that we're going to develop and follow up to this session. I've put my email address in, so if you'd like to help in developing that brief, please get in touch. And we can share the slides if you send me a message, Nicole, that's fine, yeah. Um, so just to close, Andrew, I'd just like you to reflect, and then each of you actually, to, um, but starting with Andrew, on what you would like to see from the future policy environment to support agroforestry and the kind of system that you're operating with. Oh, well, I, I, absolutely. We need to um, change the uh, grant models. Um, and it's basically the only thing that needs really to change in the grant models to allow a civil pastoral system is the open ground rules. At least the, that that's true for the um, models that we have up here in Scotland. I'm, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with the English ones. Um, but the very prescriptive models that are currently used in Scotland uh, are a real barrier and it's the open ground element which is the is the where the problem lies. It'd be very easy to change um, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Um, so I'd like to see that changed. Oh that's a nice and uh, yeah practical one. <laughs> that's actually something we could uh, really push for. So thank you for that and thank you for your contribution. Becky how about from your perspective? I think um, I think up until now the uh, sort of policy has been very binary, hasn't it? It's either farming or trees, and I think we need to develop a system which actually can bring those two together and document not just the carbon benefits, but as we've said, some of those wider ecosystem and and natural you know climate solution um, you know benefits that are coming from that. And we need to do it in a way which, as Andrew says, is not overly bureaucratic, which engages farmers and encourages them to get involved with it um, and understand the different you know, the different benefits or, or drawbacks depending on their system. Great, thank you. So Will, how do we do that? <laughs> okay, so I was actually on, my mind was on another track altogether, so, which is, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I think what I was thinking is the, um, you know, we need a flexible system that does sort of recognise huge range of um, on-farm conditions and environments, the, you know, the, the interests of the, the farmers themselves, um, and you know a, a degree of sort of you know care and um, because there are pitfalls out there. I mean, the, you know, you don't want trees everywhere. There are sort of important biodiversity, the species rich grasslands and so on. You don't want to be planting trees um, everywhere, of course. So there's the kind of necessary sort of boundaries around all of this that that have to be sort of defined and well communicated. But I think ultimately there's lots of opportunity for for win wins, carbon, biodiversity, water conservation, whatever, and and um, yeah, I think it's learning together, really, getting the experience, sharing the experience of existing agroforestry, um, tooling up advisors, really, you know, developing a really effective package that supports the, the tremendous interest that there is amongst the farming community for farming with, with trees. Thank you, and thank you for your contributions. Um, so we'll be carrying on with the ELM test, and if you want to keep in touch with that, there's information on our website. I've shared a few links throughout the session, but um, the, if you go on our homepage, you can also find Will and I and our contact details and get in touch. And we'll be developing more detail in terms of policy recommendations as that project and uh, the workshops progress. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us. We'll keep in touch, all being well. and. Uh, yeah, a big round of applause for our speakers because it was a really great introduction, interesting discussion, and uh, we'll we'll keep going. I think. So we can uh, round it up there. Yeah. I'm going to save down the chat, and uh, yeah, thank you all. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. That was really. Thank, really thank you. Thank you.
Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.